Hello, and thank you for joining us on MedEd Talks. You're listening to the podcast series, RSV Immunoprophylaxis, an Obstetrician's Guide to Enhancing Comprehension and Counseling. This continuing education activity is provided by Vindico Medical Education and supported by an educational grant from Sanofi. For program details, including how to claim credit, please refer to the episode notes or the CE information. And now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin Alt. Hello, I'm Kevin Alt, and I'm a professor in the Division of Obstetrics Gynecology at Western Michigan University, Homer Stryker, and the School of Medicine in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Sun Mahayas from the Department of Infectious Diseases at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. She's also a professor of pediatrics at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. Welcome, Dr. Mahayas. Today, we'll be discussing RSV uh, infections in infants. Uh, so for our first question, uh, how would you describe the current U.S. epidemiology of RSV in infants, and what makes this virus such a persistent public health threat? Well, thanks for the introduction, Kevin. And um, RSV has been a threat for us pediatricians since, his, since it was discovered in 1956. Um, in the U.S., RSV is seasonal. Uh, it usually peaks during the winter months and then goes away in the summer. As you know, during the pandemic, uh, we didn't have RSV for a year and it came out of, out of season during the summer of 2021. And somehow it came really back with vengeance in 2022, but since that now we are back on track. So continues to be seasonal. The seasons start around October, November peaks in December, January, and then uh, by summertime, we see low RSV activity. But why do we have, why is this a public health challenge? For many, many reasons. RSV is the number one of hospitalization in infants in the U.S., in Europe, and all over the world. This is very important. Is the second cause of infant mortality in the first year of life. Uh, and these, these deaths occur mostly in low- and middle-income countries is the number one cause of pneumonia in children under five years of age. And pneumonia, as you know, is the number one cause of mortality. And the burden is even higher in the outpatient setting. And we are probably underestimating the burden of the disease because we don't test that much. In addition uh, to the disease burden, it affects disproportionately vulnerable population, high-risk children, premature children, children with congenital heart disease, immunocompromised children, and we also know now, now know that, that it affects also the elderly. And it's a burden because the immunity is short-lived, and it can also, as we discussed, can lead to chronic sequela. So a lot of things, acute, long-term, mortality, and morbidity. Well, you, you set me up very well for my next couple of questions. So, but why is RSV such a leading cause of infant hospitalization? And if you'll allow me to editorialize a little bit, I don't think that OBGYNs really know this until they start having their own kids or start talking to their own patients who have kids because it's such a common cause of hospitalization. No, it's a, it's the leading cause of hospitalization because of the high attack rate. It's a very, very contagious virus. And virtually all children are infected by two years of age and primary infections are more severe. It affects the whole infant population. And the virus has a predilection for the small airways of the very young, of the small infant that has an underdeveloped immune response. That coupled with the virus itself, this virus is very smart. It has some components that counteract the innate immune response. So how you fight against uh, the infection. So the NS1 and NS2 protein. So it's a really bad combination. A virus that is very smart and block your immune response and a very, very young child that has an underdeveloped immune response. So uh, that's why somehow leads to these severe infections. You started to get into this next question a little bit before. Beyond the immediate hospitalizations, what do we know about longer term outcomes in infants who've had severe RSV infections? It's so an important question, and it has been very well studied over the years. Many studies, retrospective, prospective, birth cohort studies, you name it, randomized. Uh, and they showed consistently that a uh, severe RSV infection in the first year of life was associated with the development of long-term wheezing 
or asthma. Depending on the study, uh, you could see that this association lasted for 11 years, 13 years, in some studies up to 18 years. And even from the original, uh, original study, the Tucson birth cohort study, it has been shown that it can, even in adulthood, these patients that had RSV infection early on can develop like a pre-COPD type of clinical picture. So sequela is is very long lasting. So we are really in a very in a, in a very special place right now to unravel uh, whether by preventing RSV infection we can also prevent this long term sequela. Yeah, that's a great point because I'd have to think epidemiologists everywhere are kind of salivating for that data because if we can make a dent in the common asthma diagnoses they're common in children, you know, what an what a great effect that will have on children's health overall. You also started to answer this question a little bit. In what ways does annual RSV season strain healthcare resources in emergency departments, pediatric wards, and NICUs and PICUs? And that's a very good question after during the pandemic. In this 2022 season, I had a lot of interviews and I kept telling the reporters that we've had pediatricians, we've had a pandemic of RSV every year. We just dealt with it and waited for the next season. It was awful. Uh, it's a disease that is, that is unpredictable. We don't have anything to treat the disease. It's just symptomatic care. So what we do is, is uh, really to accommodate these children, suction them, give them ox oxygen uh, if they need it. And that's pretty much it. So the best way to treat ISV infection is actually by preventing the infection. One of the things that you learn if you work in big hospital systems like yours is that January, the whole hospital seems like it's full of children with RSV, the, the ER and the, and the ICU uh, boat. And we always complain that this was the worst season that we've had. And then we complain the previous one, it was similarly bad. No, that's January. Yeah, <laughs> but so. It's so, it is so bad that it's, yeah. Well, you don't think about this, and I, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but, you know, that just like during the COVID pandemic, you know, that affects your OR and your personnel and a bunch of other downstream effects. You, you know, if you're canceling pediatric orthopedic cases because you don't have enough beds to put them post-op, you know, that's really, it's it's a deep economic burden. Kind of on that same lines, can you speak to the psychosocial and economic burden that RSV places on families and you mentioned some of the high risk infants and I, I we had a premature child 20 years ago in our family. So I'm familiar with a little bit of that, but she did remarkably well. Yeah, this is something that has been understudied, but thankfully there is now more and more interesting and, uh, and data trying to understand the impact, not only on the child, but on the families. And it's actually huge. During the hospital, it's very, it's very distressing for the families because the uncertainty, the uncertainties about the outcomes, a lot of anxiety, and the disease just doesn't go away when we send these children home. Parents lose days of work. Uh, there are studies that have showed uh, reduced parental quality of life, uh, lingering sleep disturbances, like type of a PTSD type of clinical picture. Uh, and actually, infants require after they are discharged several visits because they don't just recover. This is in a regular full term. So just imagine what is the impact in a high-risk children, in a premature infant. And I've managed a lot of these children when they were intubated in the ICU and they came, they came back to the regular floor. They forgot how to suction. They have a risk of, risk of aspiration. They've been sedated. They need to recover their strength. So the uh, I think the burden for families is is huge. And until recently, we haven't been able to quantify this accurately. So th this is one of my final questions, and it's maybe the most important question for me, at least. Why is it critical for OBGYNs to understand and lead conversations about RSV prevention strategies when we're seeing patients for prenatal visits? Yeah, because this is a disease that affects the very young. And we now we have a means to intervene and protect all, all these newborns. So the OBGYN are the most trusted healthcare providers for these moms, and they play a key uh, a role in shaping the maternal responses. So informing pregnant, pregnant people and the options and the benefits of RSV prevention is fundamental. And they are in a unique position to do that. So the conversation needs to start. So they are, these families are well informed. 
I think that, you know, one of the most important things for OBGYNs and, and family practitioners and midwives to think about is what's going on in your local hospital. You know, do you have monoclonal antibodies available? This season we'll have two monoclonal antibodies available. And so this, I hope the supply issues are not what we saw the first season, but, uh, you know, so you really need to, um, get together with your friends and colleagues who are doing pediatric care. You know, that's, uh, like that's the short version. So, you know, we, we used to have a saying, all politics is local and maybe all vaccination is local too. So, and, and this is prevention. It's very important to emphasize that this is a time sensitive disease, not just something that you need to think about because the, the, the higher, the, the peak of more severe diseases around the first, second month of life. So we need to act really soon. I think the other kind of, if you allow me to editorialize a little bit, the other thing that OBGYNs could do a little better is think about the shoulder season. And you you kind of mentioned this because, you know, RSV can be unpredictable, can start early, can linger late. I don't know if you're far enough in the South that you have that prolonged season like other parts of the South do. But, you know, you need to think about it at the end of RSV season if it's really ending is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. So thank you for that discussion for those of us who provide obstetrical care. But tell us kind of now that we've talked about a half dozen questions, you know, what's the overall summary that we want to come to and conclusions we want to come to? Thank you for the question, Kevin. I think it's very important to recognize that after all these years, almost 60 years since RSV was discovered, we have different strategies for RSV prevention in the make, in the main target population either through maternal vaccination or long-acting monoclonals. Uh, we know that these products are effective, but we really need to make sure that children have access and receive them. Every year, more than 140 million children, infants are born worldwide, and, and we need to assure that these infants are protected. But what is very important to recognize, too, that we have not solved RSV yet. This virus also cause significant disease in older infants and children. So we need to continue developing preventive uh, and therapeutic strategies for the toddlers, for, for the older uh, child. And so we are in a very exciting position now, but we haven't solved it yet. Right. We have something that's going to prevent hospitalizations in the United States, but likely will pre prevent mortality. Uh, worldwide. Well, thank you for that uh, excellent discussion, Dr. Mahans, and thanks to our audience for listening. Please remember to take the post-test and evaluation or CCE credit and tune in for additional episodes within this podcast series. Thanks again for joining us on MedEd Talks. To claim credit, please refer to the episode notes or the CE information. For other episodes in this series, search for RSV Immunoprophylaxis.